Welcome to Functional Philosophy, the show in which I, Charles II, explain and apply Ayn Rand's philosophy, Objectivism. If you'd like to ask me a question on Objectivism or its application, just go to charles2.com slash contact. And my last name is spelled T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. Hello everyone, let's see what's on the list for today. First, what are your sources for your explanation of the cause of animal behavior? I am curious to read them too. This is referring to my episode a few episodes back on instinct. I have no sources you can read. If you think this requires a scientific study, you are far down the wrong road. Now, how do I know animals act by reflex? It's not because I read a scientific study. It's because I observed the world, I observed animals, and I introspected. And I have some general knowledge of evolution by natural selection. That is all you need. You have to get out of this idea that there's this magic thing called science... And as soon as the authorities tell you that something has been labeled science, then you're allowed to believe it. No. You just think about what you're asking here. Do you have any concept of what data or experiments you would even count as evidence for my claim? Do you have any idea? No. Obviously, you just think, well, if it appears in something that people have called a scientific journal or something, then I'll consider it science, too. That is authoritarianism. Now, how do I know animals act by reflex? Well, I introspect, and I notice how I act and what causes me to act. And I see, oh, my motivation comes in the form of emotions. And those emotions are triggered by sights and sounds that, in turn, trigger my subconscious to give me lightning evaluations of what I'm saying. Now, on the human level, these evaluations come from abstract thinking. So I look at animals and I say, hmm, well, let's take this beaver. Does it work like I do? Does it make abstract evaluations? And then when it encounters certain things, it reacts emotionally. For instance, let's say... I'm going to write an essay. How do I motivate myself to write an essay? Well, I think about what I'm doing, what I'm going to do when I write the essay. I think about the rewards that will come from it. I think about what will happen in the future, what I can expect. I think about cause and effect relationships. When I get these words out, I'll have solved a problem objectively, put it out in objective form, helped other people understand it, I'll have improved my own ability to write and express ideas, etc. That all requires abstract thought. So I think, hmm, does a beaver do this? Well, it seems like he might do this with building a dam, but then I think, well, but wait a minute, he doesn't exhibit this kind of behavior anywhere else. If this creature were capable of thinking conceptually, you would expect to see him apply that faculty to more areas than just building a dam. I mean, he never builds anything else impressive. He doesn't interact with the world or other beavers in a way that you would expect from something that is capable of abstract thought. So what is responsible for this beaver acting this way in this narrow area? And then I integrate that with my knowledge of evolution by natural selection. And I say, oh, this is how something like this would develop. This is how a creature would develop that has this narrow ability that to a human being might look like the product of abstract thought. Because all the beavers who didn't feel like building dams, they all died. And slowly over the course of time, because their environment is relatively static, Nature programmed into these creatures the desire, the reflex, to build dams when confronted with certain stimuli. So since I see that this beaver doesn't exhibit abstract thought, the consequences of abstract thought, anywhere else, I can look at this area where he does and say, that must be caused by something else. And what makes sense, given all my knowledge is that this beaver has built-in motivations, feelings, 
reflexes triggered by certain stimuli. And only those beavers who had that programming survived, because that's the programming that allows them to survive and procreate. And that's it. And I need no scientific study. I just have to introspect, see how I think, understand my motivations, introspect how abstraction works for me, and then look at beavers and all these animals and see how they differ and make an inference. No study, no scientists, nothing like that. I mean, outside of general knowledge of evolution. You have to stop treating science as a body of doctrine and scientists as a priestly class. That is not science. I mean, do you understand how superficially you're taking this? You are literally treating it like a competing religion, like a word. If somebody says something is science, that's good enough. It's just the authority. Because you don't know what you would even take as scientific evidence. What's the method? What's the data? What would prove animal reflexes to you scientifically? You have no idea. Because there is nothing. If what I said doesn't convince you, no amount of collated scientific data ever will. Alright, next. Can you make a video on Gödel's incompleteness theorem and how it can be consistent or not? with objectivism. And then I got this same question, I assume from the same person, phrased slightly differently. Can you talk about Gödel's incompleteness theorem? This might be what debunks objectivism. Well, no, I can't make a video on the incompleteness theorem because I am not a mathematician. And I know it has no significant implications for philosophy. The incompleteness theorem does not prove skepticism. It does not debunk objectivism. I'm skeptical there's even a valid interpretation of it within math itself, but again, I'm not a mathematician, so I won't speak on that. What I can say is that you cannot take something like math and then deduce skepticism from it. That is contradictory. That is out. You will never discover anything in math or any other area that proves skepticism, which is contradictory on its face, but no, this is just another dumb modern attempt to use some scientific or mathematical product to nihilistic ends. That is all this is, the obsession with things like the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics and Gödel's incompleteness theorem and all of these things, those are philosophical products. The fascination with these things is due to philosophy. You are not just getting, oh, look, science, just objective science proves skepticism. That is so dumb, and it is such a, really, it's such a normy thing. What bothers me about this more than anything is just how second-handed you have to be, how dumb, how much of a follower you have to be to not understand what's going on here. You don't take a second to think, oh wow, everybody does this? Even if you were being a fashionable nonconformist, even if you were just being different for its own sake, you don't go with this. This is like the hot topic of nonconformity. It is so lame. Do better than this. All right, next. What is the objectivist stance on justice, specifically the purpose of justice and the implementation of it, the primary beneficiary and the source of objective justice. Did Rand write about it at all, or are there differing views among objectivists? Well, she did write about it. You can find passages about it in Galt's speech, in Atlas Shrugged, and she also writes about it in The Virtue of Selfishness, and I'm sure elsewhere you can also read Opar by Leonard Peikoff, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. But the objectivist stance on justice is that justice is simply treating people as they deserve to be treated. Justice is, is somebody acting morally? Give him admiration. Is someone acting immorally? Give him contempt. That's the objectivist stance on justice, to put it simply. The purpose of justice is the purpose of any kind of judgment. What's the purpose <laughs> of judging a good product as good and a bad product as bad? So that you can distinguish between them and choose and use the best one for your purposes. So you can treat them accordingly 
for your greatest benefit, which gets into your next question, the primary beneficiary, you. Everything you do is for your benefit, and judgment of all kinds is no different, and justice is just judgment regarding human beings. It's just moral judgment. It's just the judgment of volitional beings. So it's just a subcategory of generic judgment. And if you understand why judging things is important, because some things are good for you and some things are bad for you, then you understand what the purpose of justice is. It's to figure out what human beings are good for you and what human beings are bad for you, what kind of actions human beings take are good for you and bad for you, and to reward and encourage good human beings and good action and punish and discourage bad human beings and bad action. So it's just objective judgment. It's just a species of objectivity. And its purpose is the same as all forms of objectivity, which is to differentiate. That's what human beings do epistemologically. That's what consciousness is. It's a difference detector. This is different from that. You know how you go snow blind when all you see is white? You stop seeing anything when all you see is the same thing? For a given period of time, you know, if you stabilize your retina, you stop seeing anything because it's constantly moving around so you can see changes. The whole point of consciousness is to see differences, to discriminate this different from that. Why? Because some things are good for you and some things are bad. And you need to discriminate between those things. This is why anti-discrimination is so evil. Because when they say don't discriminate, they don't mean don't irrationally discriminate. They mean don't discriminate at all. Not just don't discriminate against black people on the basis of racism. Don't be ableist. <laughs> don't be ageist. Don't discriminate on rational grounds. Don't discriminate on the basis of selfishness, of what's good for you, what's bad for you. That's what justice is. This thing is better than that thing. And that's a selfish judgment. Judgment is selfish. And it's exactly the same thing with human beings. The only point of judging is because it benefits you. So that's the source of objective justice. The source is the source of all forms of judgment. You have requirements of survival and happiness. And you have to judge things according to whether they facilitate your achievement of those values or hinder it. So the fact that you're a living organism who has to discriminate good from bad, that is the source of justice. And the fact that there are other people who are volitional, they have free will, they can make good and bad choices, that is the area to which justice pertains. So that is the source of justice. You're a living being, you have free will, there are other living beings, they have free will. Justice is judging when they use it for good and when they use it for ill. That's justice. Now, if you go on to have the question, oh, so should I say it's just if somebody gives me all his money and becomes my slave? That's justice because it's good for me? Well, that is not actually a confusion about justice or judgment. That is a confusion about morality as such and human interaction and what actually benefits you. If you have a question about that, you can ask that. But that's not so narrow as justice. That's a wider question. And I will take this one more. Could you explain the difference between the idea of eternal and infinite regression in time? Doesn't eternal mean without a beginning or end? How is that different from the concept of infinity in this context? Eternal means out of time. It means there is no context in which to place the thing. And the only thing <laughs> that is eternal is the universe as a whole. The difference between eternal and infinite is that eternal means limitless in the way you phrased it without beginning or end. But lacking a beginning or end is not the same thing as being infinite. Lacking a beginning or end simply means there is nothing else outside of you acting as a boundary. If you are all there is, you have no boundary. But that doesn't mean you go on forever. So limitless and infinite are not the same thing. The universe is limitless. There is no limit. There is nothing bounding it. But it isn't infinite. It doesn't go on forever in space or time. Well, forever, technically it does, because ever only means inside the universe. But it doesn't go on infinitely in space or time. 
So eternal is different from infinite regression in time, because eternal simply means you are talking about all the time that exists. It doesn't mean infinite time. The universe is eternal because it doesn't exist in this wider context of time. It's not like there's 20 trillion years and the universe exists at this time within this broader span of time. There is no time outside the universe. There is only the universe. So the universe does not exist in any context. That doesn't mean it's infinite. It doesn't go back infinitely. There is no infinite regress. Eternal simply means it goes back as far as it goes and there was nothing before it. Infinite regress means it goes back infinitely. It is so large it has no specific quantitative identity that is impossible. No such thing as infinite. Eternal doesn't mean infinite. It just means there was nothing else before the universe. Now, I know people have a hard time getting their heads around this, but it's really not that hard to understand. You're thinking there was five minutes before the universe when there was nothing, the void. So how did the universe get here? Well, it had to be super existence, which would be God or something supernatural, or sub-existence, which means nothing. This is the Lawrence Krauss, New Atheist, nihilistic view. Both of those are wrong. There is no super-existence. There is no sub-existence. There is only existence. And existence means identity. And identity means a specific quantity. So God and nothing are out. So then you ask, well, where did the universe come from? There is no from from which it came. There was no five minutes before the universe. And then the universe is here. How did it get here? There's no here. There's only the universe. You don't need an explanation. That's what you need to wrap your mind around. You don't need an explanation. It wasn't caused. It just is. It's all there is, and it's all there ever was, which is why it's eternal. There is not an infinite history extending backward. There is no infinite regress. It goes back only so far, but that only so far is all there is. And that's what eternal means. So I hope that clears that up once and for all. I'm sure it hasn't, and I don't blame you. It's hard to get straight on this, but I assure you that this issue, like free will, is not actually difficult because it's difficult. It's difficult because it's so easy. It's like Ayn Rand said, the most difficult things to convince people of are the blindingly obvious things they have refused to see. This is not difficult because it's difficult. This is difficult because it's so easy. So you've already gone past it. It's like an Easter egg hunt where the egg is right in front of you, right below your field of vision. You don't actually have to go anywhere, but your inclination is just to run out there and look for eggs. So you miss what's right in front of you. That's how this is. It's so easy. It's difficult. Anyway, <laughs> that's it for today. If you'd like to keep up with everything I do, just go to charles2.com. If you'd like to enable me to do more, just go to patreon.com slash charles2 and become a supporter. Thanks for listening. <laughs>